Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello and welcome back. How you doing, Manny? How you doing, John? Good. Manny, good to see yes. you. Well, good to see you guys. You guys are looking healthy and everything seems to be uh, running fine here. <laughs> I was talking to somebody recently about the uh, the uh, the femme fatale mm -hmm. of movies. That was a unique kind of uh, role that uh, it just doesn't seem to come around anymore. It was unique to the 30s, maybe, or the 40s. But you probably know a lot of the a lot about all of those famous femme fatales. Do you have a favorite? Oh yeah, uh, without a doubt, my favorite was Elizabeth Scott and uh, or Lizbeth Scott. Uh, she left off the E on her name. Uh, she did have an E originally. She just took it off for, of course, screen purposes. Uh, but let, before we, we, we specifically zone in on her, you, you make a good point. There was a lot of women uh, films and women act. There were a lot of actresses, shall we say, uh, that were known for their comedic ability and their light drama prior to World War II. But after the war came a grittiness uh, br brought forward by uh, the European film market. And uh, what emerged, of course, was film noir. We've had this discussion before. And a different kind of female character emerged, and that's what you alluded to, the femme fatale. And, in, and, and there were certain actresses that it fit better than others. I mean, I think Anne Sheridan, Lana Turner, Rita Hayworth, uh, uh, Lauren Bacall, uh, uh, Jane, uh, uh, um, Ida Lupino, May West. He, 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 no, not May West. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. No, there, there were these these very edgy, hard boiled, very pretty women who could drive uh, an actor to their proverbial or at least celluloid doom. And uh, and yeah. there were th those were the A listers. And then of course you had the the one hit wonders. You know the Ann Savages from Detour, the Peggy Cummins from uh, from Girl Crazy. But then there were the tweeners. And the tweeners were the ones that were not quite A list, not quite I mean familiar names, but still really had a nice long let's say twelve to fifteen year career in film noir. Marie Windsor comes to mind, but Lisbeth Scott really falls into this category. I, she she had all of the potential of being an A-lister. Um, a Veronica Lake type with a with a Lauren Bacall a, a whiskey stained voice. She could sing as well. So she could she could be one of those nightclub uh, cabaret singers who, of course, when they're not singing, they're they're luring their men to doom. So uh, I mean, she was just perfect for that. But she but she began the film noir stuff because she had been so successful on Broadway as a light comedian, uh, as actually an ingenue, actually the the heroine in a fabulous film, The Strange Loves of Martha Ivers, which which uh, uh, starred uh, uh, Barbara Stanwyck and Van Heflin, and a very young Kirk Douglas. Yet her name appears above the title of the film with Barbara Stanwyck and Van Heflin. And let me just tell you, Barbara Stanwyck was not happy about that. She just <laughs> wasn't. But the reason for this is because, like Norma Shearer's relationship with Irving Thalberg, like Jennifer Jones' relationship and ultimate marriage to David O. Selznick, um, Elizabeth Scott had a mentor, Hel B. Wallace, and Hel B. Wallace had a, a significant clout in the music, uh, in the in the movie industry. He had produced The Adventures of Robin Hood, and Casablanca. Won he himself, was a big name, yeah. Won himself an Academy Award. Later, he would do True Grit. So he was he's doing these films, and he took Elizabeth Scott under his wing. And one of the things he did was to make sure she got all the screen time she needed to try to make her an A-list star. And usually, the women that that she played opposite, in this case, Barbara Stanwyck, was not happy about this at all. But there was nothing she could do. So, was it a romantic le relationship? What do you think? <laughs> of course, that was a stupid question. <laughs> what? Do you what? <laughs> Why not? Uh, yes, of course it, it was. They're all, yeah. you know, these studio moguls. They, they're, they're human too, and you know, who knows what went on. But, but you know, um, Lizbeth Scott actually was very fond of Hal B. Wallace when, when you know, in her later years when Hal B. Wallace was honored by the Film Academy, she, in, in, in you know, 
clearly in her 70s, would speak very fondly of the man. So obviously there was a connection through her career with him. And um, they never married. Um, there might have been talk of it, but it never happened. Uh, they went off to their own to their own uh, camps with with others, but but there was there was definitely a romantic connection between the two. Now, um, clearly set up as the ingenue, kind of the heroine of the piece, opposite you know uh, uh, opposite Barbara Stanwyck's viper-like qualities, which she had you know pretty much owned in Double Indemnity. The strange loves of Martha Ivers put Lisbeth Scott on the map. So there you go. Yeah. She had a long career, mm -hmm. and she also had a, a certain, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a certain innocence about her. Yes, mm -hmm. but that's not to say that she couldn't play the femme fatale, and she, she evolved into oh. the whole femme fatale type, even though she did have a very innocent quality in her face, very pouty lips, eyes yeah. that were just very, very naive. But the minute you hear heard her talk, with that deep, deep voice. I mean, very mm -hmm. Lauren yes. Bacall kind of voice, that, that whiskey-stained yeah. voice. You knew bad things could be surrounding her. And the next film that she did that, of note that I, I'd like to mention is, of course, when she played opposite Humphrey Bogart in Dead Reckoning. It's a great film. You don't know until the very end whether she's the heroine or the villainous, the femme fatale, shall we say. You really don't know, literally, until the, the end sign is popping up that's that's how late you find out whether or not she's the kind of femme fatale that's going to bring uh, humphrey bogart to his demise and it's a great film if you've never seen a dead reckoning is what it's called yeah did um did um, the femme fatale uh, 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 the usage of them in, in movies go away for a while until maybe dunaway or stone brought it back uh, well, it's always been around a little bit. I know that, uh, that Faye Dunaway used it in Chinatown. I mean, she was real good. Kim, Kim Basinger, uh, uh, Mo Mulholland Drive, I think it was called, uh, or, or L.A. Confidential, L.A. Confidential, yeah. I think. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's a nice nickname for some, for some a, a woman of means and, and some sort of uh, uh, control who likes to take charge of a situation. She doesn't let any man get in the way, and if they have to uh, lose their life over it, so be it. Mm -hmm. uh, she made a film, a great film. It's a little uh, a little film with, with uh, Dick Powell called Pitfall, and uh, that was that's another film noir. I mean, she really cut her teeth in film noir. And, 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 you know, Dick Powell, now talk about a career actor who went through a change that was so dramatic. He went from this song and dance man, you know, 32nd Street and the like, all, and then he, then he becomes Philip Marlowe in, in a film, and and the next thing you know, he's making he's making film noir films. So you know, it, that was a great film. But I think the real for you know because Forgotten Hollywood, of course, my, my book titles, the real forgotten classic, the one that I really recommend people see, because I think this is this shows the true femme fatale, the real evil conniving woman that she could be in on celluloid, too late for tears. And it's got a great cast, including Don DeFore and the magnificent Arthur Kennedy. I can't say enough good things about the great actor Arthur Kennedy was. And of course, I, I can be equally excited about Dan Duryea. So you got these great character actors, and she is just, I mean, th there is no soul to the woman she plays. I mean, this is evil personified. Too late for tears. And it's, it's just magnificent. Every time it comes on, the movies channel on their on their film noir night. I'm riveted. I'm right there. I got the popcorn ready, and I'm ready to watch Elizabeth Scott, Scott at her sultry best. I mean, I just love her in this. <laughs> yeah. she, now she was a unique, unique let me, character. Let me also mention one other thing. Her she she's part of urban legend. She was a, an understudy to Tallulah Bankhead in a Broadway show. And the problem was is that Tallulah Bankhead had in her contract for this show a no understudy clause. <laughs> she was not to have an understudy. So that means if she could not perform, the show did not go on. Well, I mean, any anybody who's producing a, a play who has any worth at all is going to have an understudy. They're not going to lose a night. And so they brought her in, and this led to all sorts of just backbiting and sniping, and Tallulah Bankhead made sure she would never perform 
And it led to the writing of the great uh, a play and then eventual movie, uh, All About Eve. This is the story of All About Eve. You got Eve no kidding. following Betty wow. Davis. It's based on the relationship between Tallulah Bankhead and Lizbeth Scott in her first assignment which was to be the understudy now she didn't know that she was causing all this trouble and when she came to find out she encouraged it even more <laughs> <laughs> so all about eve is based on that relationship between the the, the, the play that they were both in and I, I would be remiss if i didn't tell that wonderful story that nobody knows about but it's 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 a great great story and one other thing i want to mention she probably would have had a longer career except for the fact that she had intense stage fright now not for movies and not for broadway stages but to make to do interviews to be in front of people uh you know like sign autographs and she she was deathly afraid of that aspect of hollywood so much so that it derailed her career by the mid by the mid 50s well, oh, th th another fine example of why Forgotten Hollywood is your beat, because <laughs> you have just revealed for 99.9% .9 of our audience somebody that was well forgotten if you hadn't brought it back to us. So, Elizabeth Scott, thank you, Manny Pacheco. Oh, sure, you bet. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.